Okay, so shall we try all of that again? We do apologize for our streaming issues. Something went wrong and we were apparently very pixelated and it wasn't working terribly well. So we were just driving around in silence for a little bit. I'm sort of hoping most of you got the gist of the introduction, but for those of you who missed out on it or not quite sure what it is we were saying, good morning, my name is Jamie. And this morning I have Brian Joubert on camera with me. The thumb did make an appearance, but I'm not entirely sure that anybody got to, to see it. So perhaps, so perhaps let, us, let us have the thumb return. Thumb looking very smart in his morning attire. <coughs> oh. You've got a black tie thumb this morning, feeling very serious. And it is, of course, a serious business because we've had the most extraordinary time yesterday afternoon on our very special Father's Day, well, Father's Day weekend, Sunset Safari, where the animals, as I was telling a long saga, but I'll summarize it quickly because I've already said it now once, uh, the animals provided us with the most incredible spectacle. Now, we are racing off towards the Voyatella Dam because the monkeys are alarm calling and shouting. And I think it might mean that Mvula is somewhere in the area. So while we go and check, let's head over to Brent so he can say good morning to you all. Welcome to this spectacular sunrise safari. My name is Brent, I have jean on camera and I'm sorry, I'm a little bit tongue-tired after yesterday, but what an incredible sunset safari we had. I mean, I, I just, I, it's, it's beyond words almost. But hopefully, we'll <laughs> do it all again today. I, I, I can't guarantee I'm not going to get that excited again. I just might. But today, we've got a special guest on the vehicle. Apart from Jean Ray sitting behind me, we've got the man who makes a lot of the jigger jags and thingamabobs and whatnots and if whats work that sends you this glorious picture from the African bush. And it is Mr. Peter Brass. Hello, everyone. Good to be in a vehicle for once and um, looking out for everything, but uh, enjoying it and hoping that Brent does his magic again this morning. Here we go. So Pete's along for the ride today. We are on our way down to Cheetah Plains. We actually haven't checked down there for quite a while. So I think it's worth just going to have a little squiz and check on the tracks. Maybe the Cheetah make an appearance. Maybe in Canyon makes an appearance. And our, <coughs> oh, excuse me. our tracking team is working on Vuyatella at the moment. They're also going to go check for Sindile and from Bula. So hopefully there'll be cats out and about in a few short minutes. But of course you never know, a cat could just step on the road in front of us while we're ambling down towards the east. There we go. What an absolutely gorgeous morning. It's actually quite warm for once. And as you can see, I don't have my gloves and my scarf and all my other paraphernalia that I normally wear. And it is, it is very warm. I, I guess, what do you reckon, Jean-Ray? 20, no, <clears throat> 18, 17, no. somewhere around there. But oh, apparently it's 12 and 54. Ah, I don't know. I think I'm, uh, I think it's definitely warmer than 12 degrees Celsius or 54 Fahrenheit. I think Final Control pushed the wrong weather button. Well, now they're saying it's 14. Uh, oh, Final Control. Oh, it looks like Jean Ray might have spotted some tracks. Let's have a quick look. I think we need some male lions for Father's Day. Happy fa lions. Father's Day to everyone out there. I think Jean-Ray might be chasing civet tracks again. Ah, oh, there we go. Oh, Jean-Ray, well spotted. Jean-Ray is, is, is not in trouble. He often stops me for hyena and other creatures. Lies, lies, and this time he actually has stopped me for a leopard. I'm trying to train you. <laughs> yes, the best one is over there. You should be able to see it nicely. Um, there. There we go, where my finger is. There, and a little bit to the left. There we go, right centre of the screen. Where's my finger? Let me show you with my finger. There we go. 
nice a female leopard track. So this looks really, really fresh. So before we head to cheetah plant, let's go see cheetah cut line. It's all the cheetahs today. Let me just get hold of um, our tracking team. And while I do that, let's go see what Jamie's up to in the northwest. Uh, in the northwest, we're currently seeking out the water, various water holes in this area. I've arrived at where the monkeys were said to be alarm calling. It all sounds much more peaceful to me, but we were a little way away when they first started shouting. In general, one of the most reliable animals in the bush in terms of alerting you to the presence of an animal is a troop of monkeys. First of all, because they're up in the trees, therefore they've got a, a sort of a, a better overview of what's happening around them. And then second of all, they actually have exceptionally good eyesight. Just like, well, they're primates, just like we do. A vision that is very much sort of fixed on movement. Oh, goodness. Everybody hold on to your seats as we bump along. Second time I've been over this patch. I'm going to go and check the pan outside Galago. There's a whole river system that runs around the outside of the lodges. And it provides the perfect hiding places for a leopard. Amvula, as we know, has recently sort of become something of a nomad. He no longer as far as we can tell, he no longer holds a territory per se, and he just spends his time trying to avoid the other dominant male leopards in the area, which means he's actually covering an enormous distance. That being said, I'm hopeful because I think he's hungry. I mean, I know he's hungry, and I think he might have made a kill last night. And we're going to check, and then what, if we don't have any luck here, then we'll go back and we'll check the remnants of that buffalo kill, because maybe he managed to score himself a leg or something. It was hilarious yesterday because he tried to get the carcass and then he, he fed on it for a little bit and then the hyenas came back to chase him away and then one of them walked underneath him and around him with a buffalo leg in its mouth and it was so, you could read the expressions of the, or at least the feelings of the animals so clearly because it was almost like this hyena was parading it and Mvula was in full-on furious cat mode with his tail thrashing. I actually, at one point, thought he was going to challenge the hyena for it. He didn't, which is a good thing, obviously. We want him safe and sound, but I think the thought crossed his mind. But it was a very interesting example of the way in which our predators interact. And we often, we see a lot of the, we talk about a lot of the violence and the competition and the fact that predators will kill each other if they have the chance. But the truth is, in a lot of ways, the predators are so used to encountering each other because as you can imagine, a carcass is a magnet. And it's not just hyenas that are scavengers. Leopards scavenge, male lions are some of the biggest scavengers around. So they encounter each other frequently. And for the most part, it's not worth risking injury to try and harm the other predator. This is close to where the monkeys were calling right outside the lodge and all I can see in front of me is crisscrossing hyena tracks. Sorry guys, I'm just concentrating trying to see if he's not hidden in here somewhere. There's so many hyena tracks that it's going to be very easy to miss out on a paw print. And on this special Father's Day weekend, James Richard has said that Tingana had better show his face so that we can all wish him a very happy Father's Day. <laughs> Absolutely. Tingana is the dominant male leopard in the area at the moment. And hopefully he does decide to make an appearance. I honestly, James, I have absolutely no idea where he is right now. I don't, I don't even know what area he's in right now. So 
in general, that means that he could pop out at any moment, as we had with Mvula yesterday, but it could just as easily have been Tingana. It's the interesting thing about leopards is they definitely keep us on our toes. Yes, and I think we do owe Tingana a, a happy Father's Day. After all of the aspersions that were cast upon his ability to father cubs in the time where he was mating with Shadow, Karula, Tandi, every female in the area essentially, which is how leopards breed. And yet, none of them were falling pregnant initially. And there were definitely, by all of us, some, there was some speculation as to his abilities. He's clearly proved us all wrong because there's a very high chance that he's fathered Karula, Shadow, maybe Tundi's cubs in the future. We still don't know where she is or if she's pregnant. Okay, this is interesting. Let's go and get a slightly easier view. Now here is an animal that's almost equally as reliable as the monkeys are. Kudu and Inyala with their deep booming barks and really does sound like a bark. It is a bah sound. And he hasn't made a sound. Be just bear with me for one moment. Tax is also helping me follow up on these alarm calls. Standing by Tax. It's a negative tax. I haven't gone in there yet. I'm just checking around Gallagher Pan and Vubu Vuyatela Dam. Okay, copy tax. I think then what I'll do is I'll make my way straight there. Sorry, everybody. Just arranging a search party for this male leopard because it seems as though tax has picked up on his tracks going straight back to the site of that kill from yesterday. But here's our glorious male in Yala. Before we go rushing off and have to crash through the trees and bushes once again, I have to tell you, it's quite an experience getting to that kill site. We've got a beautiful comparison here between this male in Yala and then the female that is, whoopsie, sorry, my pom pom has just made a very cameo appearance. <laughs> the little female running across behind him, totally different. The antelope with the most extreme sexual dimorphism of any of the antelope that we see out here. Total color difference, light tan colored female and the dark gray brown male and a very very distinct size difference between a fully grown female on the left and a fully grown male on the right. Definitely one of my favorite antelope, one of the most attractive to look at. But while we go and follow up on that kill site, let's go across to Brent, who has a different and fluffier antelope for you. Look how fluffy it is! They're definitely one of the cutest little baby antelopes, the waterbuck. And all the hair extended in the cold morning. I don't know, if I had to think about it, it's somewhere a cross between a llama and a kudu. And you have some impala in the background as it scooted past them. Now we've been watching this little, little one since it was about half this size. So mom's doing a good job. So far, oh, <laughs> whoops. That is an alarm. I apologize profusely. Bring me a six pack, Brent. Uh, Jean-Dre six pack. Let's make sure there's no other alarms on. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, 
head shake there. They're moving down from the crests now that it's uh, getting a bit warmer. They move up to the high ground to have a snooze during the night. It's, it's just a couple of degrees warmer high up on the crest. Now they're going to spread out and start feeding um, throughout the bush here. And you're probably going to stick to this big seep line that runs parallel to Cheetah Cut Line. And nice grass there. Now the Impala boys that jean had skipped past. There we go, jean -Dre. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're doing some quite interesting behavior there. Now they were using their pre-orbital. There we go. He's doing it again. His pre-orbital gland. Now that is a form of scent marking, even though the rut is over. So they are no longer really competing for ladies. And, and you'll see that the herds of Impala will be mixed males and females now. There won't be nearly as much pandemonium and chasing and snorting and r almost roaring, I suppose, around. So, time to put away the competition until next year and it starts all over again. Joey, 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 Joey. Joey in Australia is going to get himself into trouble. Now, Joey says, I think the baby waterbuck is as cute as Karula's cubs. Joey, I'm going to let you defend that. I'm not, <laughs> not going to try. And we're going to keep moving now and uh, start heading towards uh, Cheetah Plains. Joey, good luck, by the way. Good luck. I think you're going to have a few people who are going to disagree. I just want to have a quick chat to Ephraim who's there and I think he might follow those leopard tracks that go into Torchwood. Okay. There's Ephraim, Ephraim. Well, there's a conservative one site in that go northeast into Torchwood uh, from the sign there. Uh, I'm going to head towards you and now. Very much there. So we're going to head down towards Cheetah Plains. You can see the sun is rising in the east. It is an absolutely gorgeous African winter's morning. And I'm hoping we're going to find a big cat or five. We did four yesterday, so I think it's just, we should do five today, you know, just up, one up it a little bit. It is very exciting. I'm hoping all manner of creatures have come through to take advantage of the Cheetah Plains pan. Now, I heard last year during the dry season you get two or three hundred zebra at a time coming out of the Kruger to drink. So even if we don't see any cats, just imagine that bedazzled, spectacular sighting of all those zebra. Now, the original colonial collective noun for a zebra is a dazzle. Uh, we all refer to them as herds, but the original colonial collective noun is a dazzle of zebra, and isn't that just fantastic and dazzling at the same time? Hopefully, you see some large dazzles this sunrise safari. Remember, you can also ask us questions. If you are new, you can use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, and hopefully, between Jamie and myself, we'll be able to answer any of your ponderings about the African bush. Oh, I just want to show you this magnificent light. Look at that, isn't that just wonderful? Sun peeking up over the eastern horizon.
Now we're going to continue east. We're about to go through a dip that we might have a bit of signal break up in. So before we do that, let's jump back on board with Jamie and see what she's up to. And while Brent makes his way to Cheetah Plains, you get to come and experience the journey to the kill site, which I have to tell you is quite the epic. And just bear with me while I keep trying to figure out exactly where it was I drove yesterday. It's all a little bit of a blur. Oh, but it's not the easiest of blocks to navigate. The worst, one of the worst parts is coming up soon where we have to dodge the green thorn or the torchwood, which is much spikier than the bush on the right. Okay, that's gonna spring back and hit Brian on the thigh, which is not what I want at all. Oh, nearly speared you. Okay, so Dina, while we attempt to make our way through here, you can say that food, you know that food is food, and there really wasn't much left of that kill to fight over. Absolutely. There was hardly anything of that kill left to fight for, just the sort of the legs, which is never all that interesting, which does make me... Leaf decorations. Which does make me think that Mvula must have been particularly hungry, or he just happened to be in the area and instinct took over. And it was not really about how much food there was so much as the fact that he wanted something. But it's, it's, a, it's a very good point because there wasn't very much of it. There was some leg and a little bit of the shoulder, but all of the best bits were long gone. But then it makes me think back to that sighting that we had with Tingana and Karula. And they were actually scavenging off a buffalo carcass in the middle of a drainage line on Arethusa, so in one of those river systems again. And they were mating and they were so distracted. And they'd, I mean, there was hardly anything left of that buffalo carcass. But the next thing that Salala pride of lions descended and made their way to that particular kill and then chased Tingana and Karula off. So it's not really about how much food there is necessarily. It's just about how I'm hungry each party is. Now as we go in here, let's keep our eyes open. There's a very good chance that he's lurking somewhere here. And I don't want to miss him. The lovely thing about Mbula is that he is so beautifully relaxed with the vehicle. It's just a matter of spotting him, which as you know with leopards is always something of an interesting experience, particularly in this vegetation. This is the easy part. This is the nice part of the block. We're about to hit the more difficult patch. Going straight east. I'm just going to concentrate not being blinded by the sun and missing the obvious. As Taxon did say, these tracks coming straight in here. And he also told me that the, the hyena den is active. <coughs> oh, sorry, excuse me, I'm sorry, everybody. All the dust and plant matter that's coming through. Everybody watch heads. And as we hit the worst patch of this block and search for Mvula, I'm going to send you back to Brent, who has something very big and very grey for you. Look at these beautiful elephants in this exquisite morning light. They are moving away from us, but we, we couldn't resist showing you with the golden light coming through the leaves. Lovely big breeding herd. And it looks like they're on a mission. They could be heading out for a drink, or they could be spreading out and starting to feed. <laughs> and oh, elephants everywhere. You can just hear them trumpeting. They could also be moving at speed to try to get away from a disruptive elephant bull, like that one. <laughs> 
There's a young bull, probably late teens, early 20s. Looks like causing havoc around the rest of the herd. And yeah, the grey hornbills calling. The bird seems to have just found their voices. That, of course, is not a bird. That was an elephant. Huge safari live. Welcome to a new viewer. Warzone Maniac, welcome. Now, Warzone Maniac's wondering, how the hell do we feel safe while well, there are just animals all around? There could be lions under every bush. Well, we, we fortunately know what to do with lions, and uh, we actually spend quite a lot of time with lions. If you keep watching, you'll actually get to see a lion probably less than two or three feet away from us. Now, in the vehicle, we're quite safe. Uh, the vehicles smell of gas and oil, and uh, they don't have an instinctive response. The vehicles have only been around for about 100 years. So if you drive carefully, considerately, and you don't chase them with vehicles, it doesn't actually affect them. So we will continue to look for lions, and hopefully we will find one this morning. But I just need to move off the road before I cause a traffic jam and uh, have a quick morning meeting with Peter. Morning, 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 morning. Hello. How are you, sir? Fine, you? Very well, thank Hello. you. Where is Nkanyi? She's there. Um, she came from CP side and she uh. crossed over. <laughs> okay. But um, maybe we did the Montuances in CP. Maybe okay. she, what she'd like to do is she'd make a loop back, maybe. Oh, cool. I'll go check around three in a row. Yeah. And there was also last night some Gala audio cell, but good job. Okay, yeah. cool. Amazing. Thanks very much. Good luck, guys. Have a wonderful Thank morning. Thank you. Bye, friends. Bye. Cheers. There you go, that's Peter, he's giving me an update. So Nkanyen just crossed out of Cheetah Plans. Sad face. But as he said, the cubs could still be there. So we're gonna go have a look. She quite often likes to make those loops. She leaves the cubs somewhere. Uh, and then he also said there were lions calling last night, but quite far to the south. So maybe they had a, a hop, a skip and a jump and came to the north. Oh, hello, more elephants. Another young bull. Now, that young bull's probably trailing that herd we've just seen. They tend to try stick on the peripheries if they get too close. The big females give them a good sorting out. He's not looking too relaxed. We're not going to stay with him. You can see from his body language and the way he's moving. He's not a happy camper. So, we'll move away and let him relax. It's okay, big boy. Now, you've got to be very careful with elephants, and, and, and fortunately, their, their body language is quite distinct, and you, we are able to tell when they're, when they're calm or when they're very unrelaxed. That young male was very unrelaxed, so there's no point in, in pushing uh, or staying with him too long. Rather, give him space, let him calm down, so he doesn't develop a negative uh, association with vehicles. get an update on Nkanyini. Sorry, last station, go again. Confirm the direction of Nkanyin. Ah, uh, copy, thanks. North Best News, she has decided to go visit the Kruger National Park this Father's Day. Maybe she's got a boyfriend that side. Hi, Nancy. Nancy G. Welcome on the back of the vehicle. Nancy would like to know, have I always wanted to be a safari guide? Well, pretty much, Nancy. Uh, I've grown up in the bush. 
and uh, it was almost sort of not expected, uh, but uh, destined to be uh, in the bush at some point. It doesn't matter, safari guide, concession manager, anti-poaching. I've actually done quite a few of those jobs as well. But I really do love being able to take all of you on safari and, and, and share this incredible place with all of you. Now, yesterday we saw Mvula, who used to be the dominant male leopard in these parts, but he's been pushed by Tangana, and he's actually become a nomadic male at the moment. And Deborah's wondering, do female leopards get challenged for their territory in the same way that males do? Not quite in the same way, but they will definitely have some challenges put, put on them. So the thing is, a female, when she has a female cub, well, give away a portion of her, her territory to the cub when it's starting out. And you'll see that with Karula, she is surrounded by her daughters. She's got Shadow and Tandi. So as a, a female leopard gets older, and the more cubs she has, her territory gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And she basically gets outcompeted by her daughters. Now this isn't a bad thing. Now for that female leopard, it means her genetic line is gonna have a very strong base to work on. And that is why they do it. But it is possible for an outside female to challenge for an area. It's just more unusual than a type of behavior. Standing by. Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team has rushed. Well, sorry about that, guys. Obviously, Brent, while he was making his way towards Cheetah Plains, went through a signal dip, and I wasn't on the car. So he went off to our tech loop. I've just done a little bit of a walk. This is where we were yesterday afternoon. The kill was... Well, it started off over there where the pile of stomach contents is. Even the hyenas aren't terribly keen on that. Well, it would make sense since they can't really make any use of it with their digestive system. And then Tingana came in through those thick bushes to where the kill had been dragged to, which is over there. Now, there's two, three, there's about five drag marks moving off all in the same direction, which is straight towards the hyena den itself. Taxon said there's no carcass there. It's very clearly drag marks from the hyenas. Their tracks are all over it. And since then, the buffalo have actually wandered straight through this area, walked on top of everything. I don't think that Mvula is still in this area. He definitely hasn't left his tracks anywhere. Now with that, I think we have to start our departure from this particular spot which means a couple of very tight turns and some bashing through, bashing past at least, some monkey orange. Yeah, let's do this once again. I'm starting to feel very familiar with this particular patch of ground. And Shamsun, of course, the whole saga started, and the only reason I found this spot, which is really quite impenetrable, is because I followed the lionesses. Almost, but not quite. 
almost, almost made that turn. Um, but Shamsun, good morning to you. You were wondering whether or not we ever found the lioness with the cubs. No, we still have, well, we did find her. We found the female that we think is lactating, but she was found by some of the other guides around Tambuti Dam, which is just to the northern part of our traverse area. Sorry, Shamsun, I'm just thinking, I'm, be so, there's such a, long, a high likelihood that he is hiding somewhere in this really dense monkey orange thicket. But the thing is, so are the buffalo. I can hear the ox peckers and I can hear them snorting off in and around this, these bushes. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe he made a kill, maybe he got lucky. Let's go and see if we can't find a drag mark or something similar that might tell us what he was up to last night. Sorry everybody for the loud noises as we go through here. This was what I was saying when I said it, it gets worse. This is probably the worst patch of it. Now I do use the same tracks. You okay there, Brian? I use exactly the same tracks that I use to get in and out the entire time to make sure that we minimize the impact that we are having on an area's vegetation. Whoa. There's, no, there's nothing around here. So Shamsun, that's my next plan, is to go and figure out where those lionesses went from there. So they were on... Oh goodness. They were on a property called Buffles Hook, which is north of our Traverse area. Hopefully they haven't decided to go further north. I don't think they will have if she does have cubs hidden somewhere in this area, but we still don't know. We still haven't confirmed that. And the mystery of it is driving me crazy. I really am desperate to know if she has cubs and where she's hiding them. Not exactly the place, but where they might be. Okay, things get a little bit easier here. The worst part is behind us, and the drag marks all head in the direction I'm heading in. That being said, I'm relatively certain the drag marks are going to go straight towards the hyena den. Hyena tracks there. I'm just trying to, this is actually quite a nice block for tracking in. It's actually quite easy. The sand is relatively soft. I'm making sure that amongst the hundreds and thousands, or what feels like hundreds of thousands, of hyena tracks, that there isn't a leopard track hiding somewhere in there as well. If we don't have any luck here, then we'll go check the hyena den quickly, say hello to them all, and then we'll go and we'll search all around the area where he was last seen. Taxon has been doing that as well, and we haven't managed to pick up any tracks except for the tracks that Taxon had going into this block. And a very, speaking of denning animals, a very good morning to Liz. You wanted to know if the wild dogs are denning and if we've heard where they are denning. That yes, they will be, absolutely, so. Sorry. What's the matter, go away birds? I think that's just them doing their usual morning shout. It's an alarm call of a type of bird, or at least it's a call of a type of bird, called a go-away bird. But it isn't accompanied by any other alarm calls. It's a whee sound. Sorry, Liz, I will get back to you in a sec. 
doesn't sound frantic. It sounds just like a call between two go-away birds or a group of go-away birds. It's not an alarm call. Let's carry on and answer Lissa's question. We'll also be distracted by the Game Drive channel because it sounds as though they found two male cheetah on Torchwood. And the two male cheetah that we see regularly. All right, Liss, while I navigate this obstacle, the, um, the wild dogs will be denning. It is their breeding time, it is their breeding season. So they will have den somewhere. The Investic pack and the Sands pack, the two packs that we see regularly, I haven't heard where they have denned. There was a suspicion that the Sands pack was going to den in Ottawa. However, they haven't found that den site. There is a den site at Singita, which is a little bit further to the south of that, but I'm not sure if that's the Sands pack or a different group of individuals. And then the Investic pack, it looks as though they might, might. Now that's not going to be pleasant for Brian. They might have denned towards... Oh, sorry everybody, squeezing through. Towards the Kruger National Park. Now the last time they were seen, they were bolting around the western, uh, the eastern boundary of Cheetah Plains and I think that they might have been somewhere around there. And I just need to get back onto the Game Drop channel. I need to find out where Tex saw the lion tracks that he saw. I'm just waiting for their conversation to finish. some exciting news it appears as though I misheard something on the game drive channel I'm gonna send you over to Brent who has got a fantastic surprise for you cheetah 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 isn't this exciting now, unfortunately we've just got here and they are heading across our southern boundary so let's get a little bit closer fortunately we have the camera with the Super zoom today. So yay! Two male cheetah for Father's Day. And as most big cat fathers go, cheetah are only there for the making. Making of, not the maintaining of. So there's the one. I think both are here, but I haven't seen the other one yet. Oh, there they are. Hello, boys. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, he's got a bit of a limp. And that's not uncommon with these, these cats. Now, this is a coalition of males. They actually look quite hungry as well. Isn't that gorgeous? I hope you guys are getting some fantastic screenshots of this. Let's just move a little bit forward. Oh, isn't this just magical early morning cheetahs? Now hopefully they spot something back on Cheetah Plains. I'm just gonna get up ahead and I'm gonna swing in a few seconds. So we can get some beautiful light on his face.
beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Look at that lovely early morning light on that gorgeous big cat. Even though they're taller than leopards, they're actually sm smaller in the weight in the weight department. Wow. Well, it's this weekend is just really, really being spectacular. Quite so. Ooh, it's got a sore paw. It looks like front right. Uh, just from the way he's holding it. You can see trying not to put any weight. Now it's very difficult to, to, to determine where that injury uh, and what that injury is from. It could be from hunting, most likely. But the nice thing about being in a coalition is that if you're a bit sore, you've got your brother to help you out with the hunting. Oh, it looks like they might come back towards Cheetah Plains, and that's very exciting news for us. Look at that. Two beautiful male cheetah. Now they can reach incredible speeds of about up to 70 miles an hour and the one thing a cheetah really likes is a good termite mound and it looks like they might climb that one right there. disappeared behind. I think we're going to have to wait. There we go. Oh, at the top, just saw a head pop up. A few spots there. Wow. Smelling something on that termite mound. Now, cheetah love to scent mark on high ground. Termite mounds Fallen down marula trees, another favorite. And not only do they scent mark with urine, they also defecate uh, as well, and only defecate on high ground. And there's something very interesting smelling on that termite mound. No, don't go that way. Come back. Well, hi, Joey. Joey's in Australia, and Joey's been wondering how often do cheetah encounter other animals like lions or leopards? Probably a lot more often than we realize, Joey. Uh, the fact is that we don't actually see them too often, and if they do encounter those other animals, they tend to disappear at a rate of knots. Oh, there we go, he's popped out. Oh, there we go, I'm gonna see if we have to move. Unfortunately, they are heading southwest. We will try to stick with them. I saw the other one move through there, hoping he's gonna lie down in the shadows. forward a bit. Well, they're like, they both lie down there. There we go. They've laying down just across our southern boundary in the shade.
So Shamsun was wondering how tall the cheetah get. Uh, male cheetah can be as tall as 37 inches, uh, but generally a little bit smaller than that. And a really, really big cheetah will weigh about 150 pounds, whereas a really big leopard can weigh over 200 pounds. Well, uh, a, a very good morning to Rob and Paige, who happen to be Kirsten, our director's parents, and they're watching the show this morning, and they're asking whether cheetahs are really endangered. Well, they are. It's, it's a very interesting thing. So about 10,000 years ago, cheetahs hit a genetic bottleneck, which means they can actually genetically trace that there were less than 1,000 individuals left in the whole of Africa, and they've actually come back from that. Now, they've done some very interesting studies with skin grafts that you can take a piece of skin from a cheetah here and graft it onto an Iranian cheetah even. So there's almost no genetic variation, which makes them very va uh, vulnerable as a species because they do not have that sort of vast genetic code where certain have uh, immunities to certain diseases and whatnot. So if one cheetah is unable to defend off a certain disease, all other cheetah will be, be prone to having that exact same disease. Now, human beings have actually increased the cheetah population recently and uh, areas like Namibia and there's a very 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 healthy cheetah population on the cattle farms so cheetah are a bit small to take a, an adult cow and, and they're quite skittish you can easily chase them away with dogs and things like that so uh, leopards lions and hyenas have been removed from those areas and the cheetahs have made a comeback but they are, are truly endangered there's oof, not many left and the largest meta population in Africa, when I say meta population, it's the, the population that holds the most genetic diversity. And it's about 400, or, no, sorry, yes, about 400 or so is the low felt of South Africa. So most people would always assume Serengeti, Botswana, Kalahari, but actually the, the most healthy population with the largest genetic diversity is right here where we're sitting at the moment. Now, they have gone down. There are quite a lot of people trying to get into the sighting, and we've had such a great sighting of them walking. So while they're lying flat, I'm going to let the other guys have a chance and get in here. And if, if, if there's a space a little bit later, we'll pop back in. So I'm going to say goodbye to those cheetah. Uh, I'm just going to... Uh, any of those other stations wanting to make their way towards the Shikankank, I'll make space for you. Uh, Roy, leaving Roy in the position at the moment. Okay. Hi, Jane, who's in Texas, the Lone Star State. Jane would like to know if these two boys, who are brothers, came across uh, a female, would they fight for, to, for the mating rights over her? Now, the very interesting thing about cheetah coalitions, and unfortunately we've never seen these two boys in an, a situation where we're going to be able to, to figure out who's the dominant. And only the dominant will mate, and that other brother is happy for the for that because his genetic code is still being passed on even though he's not doing the mating itself. It is his 100% brother so they share uh, the same DNA. Now cheetah coalitions are always related, unlike lions that can be unrelated. How's it Hello. 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 And as a, unlike lions that can have unrelated coalitions, uh, cheetah coalitions are always related. And cheetah are probably one of the only species, mammal species in any case, in the world that ne need a male-dominated bias uh, for successful breeding. Now, when I mean a male-dominated bias, it means that there must be more males than females. So in every other large mammal, and specifically the cats, there are always more females than males. So you have a pride of lions filled up with females, and you have a coalition of males that might have two or three prides. A male leopard will have up to four different females within his territory, 
but cheetah they don't really have they do have territories but it's more home ranges and they and they and they do change quite frequently and female cheetah are far more uh, nomadic than the males the males will march and march and march in their little area or quite big area in this area it's in this area it's probably on average around uh, 65,000 acres per cheetah coalition but a female cheetah needs to be stimulated by turning down four or five males before she'll mate. So that's one of the biggest challenges with, with cheetah as well, is, is, is that you need a lot of males and a lot of males needs a lot of space. So if every male has 65,000 acres and, and a female needs to go past four males before she, she mates, we're now already looking at I mean, what's that, uh, 60, 20, 240,000 200, acres uh, just uh, to create one set of cubs. So it's really, it's really fascinating. Now, I know quite a few people might not like this, but cheetah are going to be one of those failed branches of the evolutionary tree, in, uh, like saber-toothed cats or uh, giant hyenas, and, and they're probably going to go extinct all by themselves. And if anything, human beings have made them survive a lot longer. Oh, it's my friend! I haven't seen him in so long! Gnormless Gnormin the Gnu! He's lost all his ladies last time I saw him. He was in the pound seat. Lots of ladies surrounding him. Now, Gnormless has gone back to defending his patch of territory from any other interloping males like normal Norman who lives on the next clearing. But, and here we go, Gnormless. And the rutting season for wildebeest has ended, so he's not so worried about keeping all the ladies. It looks like he's enjoying a lovely early morning sunbathe, warming up after that chilly night. Oh, well, let's leave Gnormless to enjoy the sunshine, and we're going to continue on checking towards the Cheetah Plains pan and then from there I think we might check three in a row pan. I'm feeling lucky. Oh! <laughs> One should look further than looking at just at Gnormless. I said Gnormless was up without lady friends. Gnormless, I apologize. Gnormless is still the, the stud of uh, the Cheetah Plains open area keeping all the ladies to himself. Here we go. A lovely herd of wildebeest. Now they probably have just finished the rutting season, so they've just finished mating. But these short grass plains are still holding quite a bit of nutrients, and that's what's bringing these wildebeest back and back here. And that's why Gnormless and Normal both have such great territories for this part of the world. And they don't want to have a territory that's in the thickets. I want to have a territory on nice short grass plains and wildebeest are very picky, picky eaters and they like short grass. Now we're going to go see if we can find any sign of leopards on the northern part of Cheetah Plains while we do that. Let's go see what Jamie's been up to while we've been frolicking about on the plains. And what a wonderful frolic it sounds like. Cheetah have made their way back towards Cheetah Plains. It's terribly exciting. And while you've been with Brent, I've picked up on a set of very fresh female leopard tracks coming towards Buffles Hook Dam. There's also several fresh lion tracks coming towards Buffles Hook Dam, so it's all become a little bit confusing. Tax has found where the females crossed over back into Torchwood. But there's still male tracks that remain unresolved. Plus now we've got these leopard tracks wandering in here. And we've got all makes for a very, very exciting mix of what we could see. And I think getting to see the three big cats in one morning, what do you say, Brian? Mm. Yeah, why not? And a very big Father's Day shout out to Jerry's father. Jerry, of course, works for Wild Earth as our fantastic producer. Also, sometimes with her exceptionally 
far better than my taste in clothes. She's also my assistant when it comes to making sure I look relatively neat. But Jerry sends out a Father's Day message to her dad, Mark, who I've met. Hi, Mark. Jerry says she loves you very much and thank you for watching our show. It's fantastic to have you on board. It's a lovely message. Don't forget to send through your Father's Day shout outs to all of your dads. I'll do one for my dad at some point. Oh, yes. You see, you should still be watching. I just want to make sure that I don't miss out on finding these lions first. Okay. It's a bit tricky. There's been quite a lot of vehicle traffic along this road this morning. The line tracks are going straight here, and I don't know where they've gone since. They've been driven over, as have our leopard tracks, sadly. But the good news is that we've got Herbert and Johnson as well to help us find tracks, because we can't really be off the vehicle for too long. We've got them to help us follow the tracks that we find. I have a suspicion that these lines are somewhere very close to Buffleswick Dam. They've been hanging around here a lot. And the fact that there's only, there's actually only one set of tracks crossing back into Torchwood from the females. Let's check something here. I don't think it's exciting as it looks. No, it's just hooves falling on top of each other. go and investigate. Now those female leopard tracks could also be Karula's tracks. She does come all the way north up this in this direction so it is entirely possible in which case she's going to start making a beeline south to where her cubs are. That of course is if it is Karula but it, it makes sense this is one of her spots. It is within the, the boundaries of her territory or her home range. And Karula does cover tremendous amounts of distance. As can all leopards, but I've noticed it particularly with Karula. And just chatting a bit about leopards, and of course there was the dramatic scenes yesterday with Sindile and Shadow, his mother, and Shadow's brand new cub. And everybody, I think, feeling very torn in that situation as to how that played out. And it's a situation that I've never experienced before. I've never seen, I've never been involved in a sighting like that where a, a young male has been removed for good reason from a, a wild area and kept in quarantine and then been re-released back into the same area. I've never in all my time in the bush ever experienced a situation like that. But Christopher wants to Christopher wants to know whether or not Sindile will ever carve out his own shadow or uh, his own territory, not his own shadow, shadows his mum, or if he will be forever nomadic. And absolutely he could carve out his own territory. Not yet. He's still too young. He's going to have to remain somewhat nomadic, base, nomadic, basically what's known as a dispersal male. He's going to have to go off, keep hiding, keep himself safe and away from other male leopards and wait until he is big enough and strong enough to compete for his own territory. And that will probably only happen when he's around five years old, maybe even a little bit older, depending on how fast he grows. He's got good chances though, I mean, there's a chance that either Tingana or Anderson is Sindile's father, which does mean that he's got some good genetic prospects in terms of size. And that is basically what matters in terms of a young leopard establishing themselves a territory. I'm hopeful, I think he could well. The chances are though, when he does establish his territory, it could be miles away from where we are now. 
generally that's the idea. The females stay closer to their mothers and the male cubs, once they have dispersed, cover enormous distances. In one case, a good couple of hundred kilometers of distance before the male in question settled down and established themselves a territory. Okay, so we've got to look for spotted spotted cats and tawny cats. We've got prospects of both here. And I don't see either. I do see a plover and that is it. As you can see, most of you know by now that there's been some, what did we call it? Some Renovation. renovations. Thank you, Brian. I couldn't think of the word. I was struggling there. <laughs> renovations. Thank you very much. There have been some renovations to our various water holes. There are now, we can now drive across the bridges or the dam walls. We've got nice open spaces. And by the looks of things, I might even be able to go and investigate that block that is to the north of Bufflesook Dam. And I'm thinking perhaps that might be a good idea because that is where the tracks disappear into. So perhaps we should just go and have a look. There you go. The animals love that particular spot. It's nice and sheltered, but it's also close to water. So I think let us go and investigate that side of things. Let's see how far that road extends. I'm curious now. But before we do, just because they've been quite entertaining, it's always fun to just sit and watch hornbills clucking their way through elephant dung. In this case, a red-billed hornbill, very much focused on plucking out anything he can find. And of course, he's searching mainly in these piles of dung, he's searching mainly for the termites that will start to deconstruct the elephant dung. Not just that, sometimes they get really lucky and they get a bonanza and they have the prospect of a dung beetle larvae in the dung as well because not all of our dung beetle species actually bury the balls that they make. Some of them just lay their eggs in dung balls and leave them to fend for themselves. And I always enjoy watching hornbills because the most fascinating part is the movement of their head and the way that they make up for the blind spot that runs straight down the center of the beak. away. And there was something so prehistoric as well about the way that they run. Okay, let's go and investigate this road that runs up the other side of Buffelshook Dam. If we can, of course, I just realized I might have might be approaching from the wrong angle, but let's see. Uh, while we continue on and search the northern side of Buffelsook Dam, let's head back to Brent on Cheetah Plains to see what he's snacking on for breakfast. Of course, I was caught eating my nachi. Now, nachi is a truly South African word. Um, I'm not actually quite sure. I think, uh, from what I understand, what you guys call nachi Nachis in North America, I'm not sure what they call them in Europe, it's a, it's a, it's a clementine. But I, I'd never heard that word till the other day. Uh, it's like a mini orange, <laughs> but it's easier to peel. But very, very tasty. And one of the nice things about living in the Lowfeld is not very far from us, so it's probably one of the, the biggest fruit producing areas in South Africa. 
So in this area, we produce a lot of avocados, uh, nachis, oranges, lemons, uh, mangoes. Um, what else? Bananas. Bananas. Yes, there is. Jean has got a banana for his his snack while on drive. Uh, Jean Dre. I don't think I've ever met someone who loves bananas as much as Jean Dre. Though. He even sings about them when we're off air. <laughs> Jean Dre, would you like to give us a little verse of your favorite song? Put a banana in your ear. Put a banana in your ear. Put a that is... banana right into your favorite ear. It's true, so true. When you're down and feeling blue. Okay, I said blue. one verse. <laughs> yeah. So the problem is when Jean Dre starts singing, he doesn't stop. <laughs> Uh, but there we go, there's Jean Dre's favorite song, Put a Ripe Banana in Your Favorite Ear. How and where this song comes from, I have no idea. Uh, I'm completely flummoxed about what I was going to say it next. It works, I promise you. <laughs> if you're feeling sad, just put a banana in your ear. There we go. Apparently, if you're feeling sad, put a banana in your ear. <laughs> <laughs> but there we go. But uh, um, in the Western Cape, uh, they produce a lot of other other fruit and apples, grapes, and we've just spotted. Oh, there's another one there. I'm just trying to see which is going to be the best one. A really beautiful, beautiful bird. Is it going to lovely land out in the sunshine for us? And it looks like it's got a wor Oh no! Don't fly away, you evil creature. There we go. Oh. Now, it used to be called a red-billed wood hoopoo. Oh, he does go have, a, have a little caterpillar. Oh, isn't that stunning? You can see the iridescence coming off the sunshine, and little white bars in the tail. Oh, off it goes. Uh, if I remember correctly now, it's called, a, not a violet wood hoopoo, a green wood hoopoo. So it's got that r sort of greeny-blue sheen to it. They are incredible. They, they, they live in little flocks. And if we keep quiet, Oh, there it is again. Oh, and off it goes again. There's another one on the ground. Um, oh, where's my hand? They've got the most incredible call. And there we go. There it is. The most incredible call. And you can see that recurved sort of scimitar-like bill. And it's specially designed for being able to get through the cracks under bark get into little holes and one of their favorite foods is of course caterpillars as we saw that one had one but also wood borer beetles and that beak is specially designed for removing those borer beetles from the wood now the Zulu name for them is is, is actually quite funny it's called a Llegawafaz basically means a cackling or laughing woman. And their call is quite incredible and, it, and it's, it's very loud and carries on for a long time. And uh, the whole joke is that when the Zulu ladies, oh, oh no, that's a, a red-billed buffalo weaver juvenile without the red bill yet. <laughs> nice camera work, Chandra. So, we've already done the big cats, so let's see if we can get our birders a few more ticks on their list. And there's some incredible birders on the live safaris. I mean, there's people sitting with 200, over 230 species. And uh, if you're still building your nest, uh, your list, let me know, not your nest. <laughs> Thinking about birds, uh, let me know. And let us know how your, your bird list is going. Like that, searching. Oh, 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 there we go. Oh, got one. And remember, if you want to let me know about your bird list, hashtag Safari Live, how many birds are on your bird list. Or if you're missing a particular species you would really like to see, uh, also pop that on with the hashtag Safari Live, and we will try our best to find you that particular species you might be missing. Oh, wasn't that wonderful? Off they go. Nice camera work by Jean-Dre. Of course, filming birds live is a, a new challenge unto itself. 
and we're very lucky to have the incredible camera crew we do. Not only do they have to film the animals and the birds live, they're going to try to follow uh, our voice right on the edge of that marula. Zoom. A little bit to the left. There we go. Oh, there's a little fly catcher there for a second. We'll see if we can get another view of it. Now, the nice thing about Cheetah Plains, Cheetah Plains has definitely helped quite a few people's bird lists. We've seen um, some lark and pippet species that we don't really see on Jumal on these nice open plains. Oh, there's the cackling. Oh, now they go quiet. But there's that cackling that where the, the wood hoopers get their Zulu name from. Let's see if they do it again. Oh, <laughs> not wanting to cackle for us again. So the story, the Zulu story goes, is that it sounds like ladies when they were working. There it is. So the story is that, that it sounds like ladies working in the field. So while they're harvesting, uh, Zulu ladies can be quite vocal and, and they laugh and tell lots of jokes. So that's where their, their Zulu name comes from. They're just keeping ahead of us. There's, I can hear some other bird species around. There, there's a cackle. Well, no, they're keeping quiet. We, I can hear another bird in this weeping. There we go. jean has got a fork-tailed drongo as well as the wood hoopoo. And I hear another bird. But they are disappearing. As again, remind me what your bird lists at and uh, if there's a particular species you're looking for, also let us know, hashtag Safari Live. But in the meantime, let's move away from our feathered friends to a large mammal. A couple of large mammals actually, enjoying a various breakfast snack around the bush willows and knob thorns of this area. Definitely no sign of our leopards and lions, but I did discover that the road took me all the way back north from Buffelshook Dam to our northernmost boundary, which was really useful to know. The animals absolutely love to use that road, and there are just tracks everywhere. But in the meantime, we were asked yesterday morning about whether or not we could actually track individual antelope as well as leopards or lions. And I said that probably we could, but we're just seriously out of practice in that sense, since we don't really focus on tracking the individual animals, the individual antelope at least. That being said, I spent a few months, or a few weeks, a couple of months ago, tracking groups of kudu like this one, because all of the kudu in that particular group were exceptionally pregnant and it actually led to some incredibly rewarding sightings of the young kudu calves stumbling about and taking their first steps into the world. Incredibly special moments that we get to experience on these live safaris. I think kudu might be one of my, fa I don't know, I'm going to stop trying to say which antelope are my favourite and which ones aren't. I give up trying to pick them. I definitely think the bushbuck is high up on my list. The nice thing about kudu though is the more you look, the more you, the more kudu you see. But they're not territorial and they're not really herd animals in the same sense that an impala or those wildebeest that you saw earlier with Brent are. They form what's similar to giraffe, they form what's known as aggregations. So there's no set pattern to it. Often the females will stay with their mothers for an extended period of time. Sorry. Or the 
males like to come and associate with the female groups every now and again. Other than that, completely peaceful, not territorial at all, unlike the wildebeest that you saw with Brent. And exceptionally elegant animals. There's a young male that's slowly making his way after the rest of them. Look at how skinny he is compared to a big male kudu with their enormously thick necks and long horns. He's got a, an almost female sized neck. Sorry, boy, not meant to insult you. I'm sure you're going to be gorgeous when you're older. But now he's just quite, quite a lot more gangly than an adult male kudu. Okay, let's move on, I think, and go and check the areas around Buffelsfuck Dam. I'm sure these lions are in here somewhere, and I know that this female leopard must be in here somewhere. It's just a matter of figuring, figuring out exactly where they are. Sorry, Kudu. Come through slowly. Slowly, slowly. What we can do... Since our Kudu have moved off, give you a nice example of what a Kudu track looks like. Since we don't often stop for antelope tracks, and I said that we could, if we felt like it, or if we learned to, look at individual antelope tracks. Do you think you can get there today, Brian? Here we go. Let me jump out and just show you quickly exactly what a kudu track looks like, because it's not terribly easy to see in the sand. But they were a lot smaller. Whoops, lost my hat. They were a lot smaller than you expect them to be for an antelope of this size. Best one, this one, Brian. Now, if you have a look here, they're very, very small. They're about the, the length of my finger, which isn't particularly large. When you think about the fact that a lion, which is probably not that far off the weight of a kudu, has a paw the size of my entire hand. Very heart-shaped, slight rim walker. In other words, the edges of the track are very, very defined, as is the sort of the, the hump in the middle the gap between the two halves of the hoof. And very often with antelope, when they move through thick sand like this, then you'll get a slight scuff mark where they've dragged their toes. Another thing that's very distinctive of an impala track is that it will what's, do what's known as basically partially registering. So the back track falls essentially on the front track, only leaving a little bit, tiny little bit, of the side of the front track sticking out, but the back track mainly obscures it. And you'll find that something like that, an approach to striding like that, is what will tell you a great deal about the way that an animal lives. So not all of the antelope species do it, but something like a kudu that is adapted for subtlety and secrecy and hiding in thick vegetation, and nyala and bushbuck, they all register because it's quiet. So you minimize the amount of noise that you're going to make because if your front foot is stepped on a stick, your back foot falls in the same place. So it doesn't step, the stick's already broken. It doesn't run the risk of stepping on another stick somewhere else and making more noise. So it's just quiet. It's the same thing the big cats do. So antelope register just like big cats. We just don't often stop to have a look at the track. The Nyala track, in comparison, is where I get... I know this is a kudu track because I just watched the kudu walk across the road. But Nyala tracks and kudu tracks are very, very similar. And I can't claim to be... I've learned now, but it took me a while to learn how to tell the difference between them. It's not always that easy. All right. Continue on our lion search. circle around there and talk about our different antelope species. Marianne is wondering a little bit about our zebra, which are of course the odd-toed ungulates versus our even-toed, our antelope and our bovids, our even-toed ungulates. And Marianne, good morning and as always welcome to the Sunrise Safari. You wanted to know 
whether or not we get Gravy's zebra out here? And the answer is no, we don't. The only type of, the only species of zebra that we get out here is called a plain zebra or an, a virtual zebra. Now, I bet many of you didn't realize that there are actually different species of zebra if you're watching for the first time. It's not really something that people talk about. Here's my leopard tracks, by the way. Sorry, just to show you something interesting because these are, these are relatively fresh. Sorry, Marianne, I will get back to you in a moment. I just want to get out and I want to circle these for Herbert and for Johnson at a later date. Beautiful little female leopard tracks. Now, I know that Brent's already spoken about female leopard tracks today, so I'm not going to linger for too long with them. I just want to go circle the last track, which is... I never actually stop and look when I'm getting out of the car, and I probably should, is here. Okay, it's there. It's, I'll stop now. <laughs> Amazing what our instinct is as soon as we see a set of tracks like this that are so beautifully fresh, and on top of most of the vehicle tracks, your instinct is to just start walking in that direction, but I won't. And go to Cheetah Cut Line and see if they don't pop out there. I think she's crossed one of the roads up ahead, but because there's been so much vehicle traffic this morning around that area, I think she's probably moved on. And if it is Karula, she's going to be on a mission. She's going to be wanting to get back to her cubs. I don't try, that's why I stopped to check around here to just see if she hasn't hidden a kill somewhere in this vicinity. And now has to go all the way back to fetch her cubs. It's far. It's a good, probably a good three or so miles. I suppose that's nothing for a leopard. And even for a leopard cub. All right, let's go search. Let's go figure out if that's what's happening here. Sorry, Marianne. I completely, completely got distracted from your question. Zebras, Grevy zebra. The only place you will find them is up towards eastern Africa. So it's not a species of zebra that we find not only in the Sabi sands but also in South Africa in general. South Africa only has two species. The one that we see, the plain zebras, and then the Cape Mountain or the mountain zebra, which are also critically, critically endangered species. We don't find them here. As the name suggests, you'll be more likely to find them around the Cape or the Western Cape areas. I have a sneaky suspicion the lions have got a kill in here somewhere and that the, that set of tracks that Taxon found was just the female going back to suckle her cubs. Let's go and investigate and see whether I'm correct. There's just so many lion tracks wandering about and there's too few tracks popping out. So while I go and investigate and try and work out exactly what's going on with our lions and leopards, Let's head back to Brent and find out how his scouring of Cheetah Plains is going. Now we had that report about Nkanyin crossing into Inkoro, so it's quite likely she might have left her cubs in this area. So we're just doing a quick scope around, seeing if we can see any tracks. It flew away very fast, unfortunately. There was a beautiful bird called the black-headed oriole. Now, I still haven't heard from you. What birds are you missing on your lists? Remember, hashtag Safari Live, and we'll see if we can find it. <coughs> now, Aaron has uh, decided to make it a little bit difficult. Now, he is from New Zealand, so that explains why it's difficult. He'd like to see a fish eagle, and uh, it's his, his favorite bird. Unfortunately, we don't have any big bodies of water. I mean, there's always a chance when we go across to Arethusa that there might be a fish eagle taking advantage of those catfish stuck in the mud. But at the moment where we're moving it, 
it's going to be quite difficult. But you never know, we might find one flying over between bodies of water. Chris Rogue, 235. That is incredible. That's Chris, Chris's bird species number. Now, these are male leopard tracks I've spotted here. Yeah. Looks like, there we go. And these look quite fresh. And I'm hoping maybe it's Mr. Quarantine. And they're heading towards a three in a row pan, which is a well known hangout for Mr. Quarantine. And wouldn't that be fantastic to see him again? I've only seen him once down here on Cheetah Plains since he sort of left Juma. And he moves between Nkoro, Cheetah Plains, and Torchwood. He's still there, and that he is. Oh, oh dear. Don't go that way. Don't go that way. There we go, there we go. Oh dear. And unfortunately, into Nkoro. And maybe he'll loop back around towards the pan. There's a really fresh track, so. Maybe he's sitting right here, watching us, looking for him. Maybe he just went to visit that big termite mound. He's going to pop back on the road. <laughs> I thought he was might be on top of that termite mound for a second, but it's just one of the chimneys. So there is a possibility he went to check the termite mound and he might come back through the waters just over here. Quran. Where did it disappear to now? Here you go. That's being a bit scarce. There was a red crested Quran. But as the wind's picked up, the birds are becoming a little bit less, less cooperative. And a uh, very good morning to Shamsun. How are you this morning on this Father's Day? Well, I think it might still be yesterday, <laughs> depending where you are in the US. And Shamsun would like to know if we imitated that mother leopard contact call. Ow. Ow, ow, could we call cubs out? I think that you probably find some people can do it well enough uh, that they might be able to. Uh, I don't think mine's quite up to scratch, and uh, I think the cubs would know uh, it was a fake. But I think there are definitely there are definitely people who might be able to to de uh, to imitate that sound well enough that it could bring those cubs out. Now I got confused. I thought. That leopard track went into in coral. It didn't. Uh, it was one road deeper inside uh, Cheetah Plains than I thought. So we're not going to go straight to the water. We're going to check now down towards the boundary. Now the last view I had of Quarantine as he left three in a row pan was actually right here as he disappeared into the darkness. But there's some birds while we continue to look. We go into that little to the right slightly. Oh no, straight 
zoom straight in top of that top of that little tree up up to the right there we go and there's a nice little bird to get the bird watchers brains oh going but it's going to have to be a quick id as if you were here so maybe you got some screenshots of that but why don't you tell me what little bird that was if you know the answer uh, send your answer through to the hashtag safari live on twitter let us keep moving and looking for those leopards uh, ellen fowler hi ellen always great to have you with us uh, ellen is a a long time super fan i suppose we can say and ellen definitely helps us out with uh, the leopards and whatnot and what's going on and what happened before we arrived and Ellen would like to know, do we have any confirmation on whether Shadow's surviving cub is a girl or a boy? It is, I'm very happy to announce, a young lady. So it is a little female. And hopefully she survives. I really, really like that little cub. That was the first time I'd seen it. It was the first time we'd seen it on Safari Live. But she was absolutely gorgeous. So just a little bit younger than uh, Karula's, a month younger than Karula's too. Now, unlike Karula, who we know the exact date of birth of those gorgeous little cubs, um, Shadows, we're gonna have to do a bit of guesswork and because we didn't find her on the den like we did with Karula. So, but on, we'd probably say they're about a month younger than Karula's. So Karula's cubs are currently four months old, so Shadow's probably just under three. A huge Safari Live welcome to another new viewer, Shabo. Great to have you on the back of the vehicle. Shabo is asking, why are lions and tigers not visible on a good winter's afternoon in South Africa? Well, first, firstly, unfortunately, tigers only live in the east, so they don't even live anywhere in Africa. They're not naturally occurring here. But lions, if they're around, they're definitely worth having a look at on a good winter's afternoon. But they only really get moving a little bit later. So probably around our local time, 5.30, 6 p.m. So if you do find them on a winter's afternoon earlier, they normally fast asleep. And lions are incredibly good at sleeping. They sleep about 20 hours a day on average. Um, that leopard track went on the path through here. So if he doesn't come out here, I'm gonna go back to the last tracks and take a little walk. Now, if it is Mr. Quarantine, some of the most fun I've ever had with a leopard on foot was with him. And uh, I went off tracking and I knew he was there. I'd heard alarm calls. I'd been around and around, followed tracks. He'd gone all sorts of directions. I just couldn't find him. And uh, Brian was with me. So we decided we were going to talk about a tree that I was standing next to off the vehicle. And as I started talking about the tree, Brian just went like that. And quarantine had followed me back to the vehicle and he was watching me do a whole big spiel about a zizzy or <laughs> a buffalo thorn. And he was about 10 meters away, just sitting there watching while I talked about and ate leaves off this tree. So he is definitely high, high up on my list of leopards. And he is an incredible character. So I'm really hoping it's him. It could also be Shavambalan, who is another one of a Karula, a Karula's offspring, but I have never seen Shavambalan. And he is also seen in this area quite frequently. So far, so good. We don't want any tracks coming across because this is our boundary.
Maybe he's just here somewhere, mm. basking on a termite mound. Okay. If he hasn't come through by that pile of elephant dung, I think he's still behind us. Okay, let's turn around. I'm going to head back towards those last tracks. But before I head off, we're going to have a quick look at that bird we did and the quiz. And uh, it was definitely a flycatcher. So well done to those of you who got flycatcher. And I'm going to show you which one in a second. Okay. Oh, there we go. So much better than having a book. So much faster. I feel quite professional with my iPad here. And fly catcher. So we're on the fly catchers. There you go. And well done to Dance Anyway and Siberia Zumi who got it spot on. It was indeed the African dusky fly catcher. Now, what we were looking at is that little white around the eye is one of the diagnostics. And then a very pale patch under the tail. And also no barring, no white barring on the tail, which is the giveaway. And here we go, there's a picture of one, the African dusky flycatcher. Well done! And it wasn't an easy one because it was so quick. And while we go to see if we can find this male leopard, uh, let's head across to Jamie, who's got the smallest member of the carnivore family in Africa. The smallest member of the carnivore family out here in terms of mammals. We've got a lazy group of dwarf mongoose. That being said, it's not really so much laziness as the fact that they're cold. And even on a day like today, where the temperatures have are definitely a massive improvement on some of the chilly mornings that we've experienced, they're still a little bit reluctant to head out and about and in fact enjoy this first hour sort of between half past eight and half past nine to do exactly what one is doing which is stretch out have a good stretch of the muscles and sunbathe for a little bit so it gives them an opportunity to just aloe groom for a tad reinforce the bonding that is so essential to the survival of a dwarf mongoose family They're absolutely fascinating little animals there's always something happening, something going on. And the nice thing is getting to know the different family groups around here and just how used to people they are. This group, for example, is somewhere in between. We've got some dwarf mongoose that will come right up to the car and are not bothered by our presence in the slightest. Some that disappear the moment you come around the corner. And then this group, which is comfortable enough with the distance that I'm at, which is probably about 30 or so feet, without us being able to come any closer. But they do have a natural curiosity, which means that even with the most skittish of dwarf mongoose groups, you spend enough time with them, and you sit quietly and you don't make any sudden movements, and get them coming right up to the wheels of your vehicle to investigate the smells, and sometimes even have a, a sort of a curious nibble around the tire itself, kind of like our hyena cubs in a way. It's a nice moment while we sit and watch them to just listen to the bird life around us and so listen for any alarm calls. Ooh, that wasn't a very graceful descent at all. <laughs> uh, James Richard, you're wondering on the subject of our dwarf mongoose what the furthest distance is 
that a mongoose group will forage away from their main den site. And it's a difficult one because they basically will just move from den site to den site. Um, they might be spending the night in one and then get quite far away and decide that actually it's maybe time to go to bed and they'll just pick the, ne the nearest den site that they've already established. That being said, they don't cover enormous distances, James, so unlike meerkats, which actually can cover tremendous amounts of ground, and you can just ask Brian, having had to spend time filming them in the Kalahari, they were bound about for, how far would you have said you had traveled following mongoose, Brian? Um, I followed meerkats. Oh, sorry, meerkats. Up meerkats. and down on a daily basis, maybe six, seven miles. That's incredibly far. So that's how far Brian would follow them, just meandering in and out. In a straight line for these mongoose, I would say that the furthest that their territory would extend, if you imagine it as a radius radiating out from a den site, would probably be about a mile, if that. But the reason behind that as well, is so because these little chaps are actually very territorial. So are, mong so are meerkats in their own way. They do often, when they encounter another group, they get very aggressive, they get all puffed up and their tails go upright and they race at each other. The difference is that the density of dwarf mongoose is much, much higher than the density of meerkats in that kind of arid area. And that's just because it's a different ecosystem completely. So for dwarf mongoose, there's enough here, even in the drought period, which admittedly is a bit harder for them because the insect life is not as explosive as it might usually be. But even then, there is enough in the way of resources to support multiple mongoose groups in a territory that would be the size of a meerkat territory. <laughs> Dashing about, it's almost time to get up now guys. Time to start looking for food. And digging their way through the soil. That little one I actually think might actually be in the tunnel itself. He might be excavating more than digging for food. The one in front is definitely searching for whatever snacks they can find. Hmm. The one at the top there is definitely the most reluctant to head out. He wants to stay there. He's found a comfortable spot, have a good groom, it's nice and warm in the sun. Not in any kind of a rush to head out. Oh, there we go. Maybe it is time to leave. Get out and start foraging. It's always fun to stop and look at some of the smaller things and just listen to the sound of the bush around us. It's still very, very windy. Not very windy, but it is windy. It's windy enough to make a lot of the animals out here feel a bit skittish a bit nervous of whatever is happening around them. And for good reason, judging by the amount of lion tracks that I've seen wandering through this particular spot. Speaking of which, I think it's time for us to continue on our search. Still want to make sure that this female leopard that we saw the tracks of earlier hasn't come cross south along this road. She might have been ducking and diving though, especially if there were lions around definitely try and avoid them. This is one of the spots that I, in fact this is, might be, even be the exact place where I had one of my first sightings with Karula, or at least one of the first sightings that I actually found her. I didn't respond to somebody else calling me in. And it was with Andrew many, many months ago, close to a year ago, and it was one of those unexpected rainfall moments in our dry season. We started pouring with rain as we found her. And at that point, we didn't even have the rain cover set up that we have now. And we had to disappear off to cover and leave the female leopard that we had just found to wander off into this drainage line. And we know that she does spend time around here. But Karula's territory seems to be getting smaller and smaller. Good morning to Shabo, who is one of our newest viewers. You wanted to know how a mongoose finds water if they cannot visit the waterhole. 
Well, for such a tiny little animal, that's a really, really good question because I've just spoken about the fact that they don't tend to go far from their den site itself. Now, the truth is, mongoose are not water dependent really in any way, the same as the meerkats. And they get a lot of the moisture that they need from the food that they eat, from the insects that they eat and the various other things. They're quite good at adapting to their water needs in that way. That being said, especially at this time of year, there's a great deal of dew on the grasses and the trees and the leaves. So what they'll do is they'll go and they will lick the moisture off the leaves, so the droplets of water. Beautiful in Yala in this morning sunlight with her white and tan contrasts. She's actually got a bit more white on her than a normal in Yala. She's walking a bit stiffly. I think she's had some kind of an injury. It's not, not serious, she's not limping. Just got a stiffness to the way that she's moving. Here come the rest of them. Hello ladies, do you know where the lions are perhaps? Because I'm just listening to the Game Drive channel and it sounds like the tracks are all heading in our direction. And off they go. Okay, let's keep going. I just have a feeling these lions are hiding somewhere off in the block. Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater. Whoopsie daisy. Sorry about that, everybody. It seems as though for some reason we lost a little bit of signal here. As you know, bringing you a live safari from the middle of the African bush does occasionally have its challenges. And it seems as though Brent was, is off on foot tracking his leopard. So that's where he's gone. We couldn't go across to him, but hopefully our picture will be stable enough for now. We'll make, try and make sure that we stay up on the crests of the hill for the moment while we figure out what's happening. And I'm going to do one last loop around towards Buffelsock Dam because I just know that these lions are here somewhere and that leopard. Her tracks are also incredibly fresh. And we have another lovely question from one of our newer viewers, Farouk in Tampa. Good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. We wanted to know why is it that we know the individuals of this area, or the individual lions, are lions limited? Um, and how many lions there actually are? Well, the thing is, Farouk, we've, we've got close to 4 million hectares of wilderness area, which is about 8.5 million acres of unfenced wilderness. And within that, there could be up to about 3,000 lions throughout that area. So the lions are not limited. What is limited, and for good reason, is the places that we can drive. You can't have everybody driving everywhere because it would push, put certain places under pressure. So we've actually got a slightly, or well, much more restricted, we've basically got a tiny little percentage of that magnificent wilderness area in which we drive. And what that means is because lions are territorial, they have set places that they move in because each group of lions has their specific spot. 
And what that means is that whilst we see lots of lions, we usually see the same prides or the same male coalition. So at the moment we've got the Inkahuma pride, which are the females moving around here, and the Birmingham males, which are the dominant male, which is the dominant male coalition in this area, so a group of four males that patrols their territory. We also see the Styx females. However, yes, we do get to see different lions every now and again, because whilst lions have territories, those territories are often in a state of flux, with the females not necessarily moving too far, unless there is pressure from other males. And for a male lion, there's always the threat of a, another male coalition, another group of males coming in to try and establish themselves in a territory. And what that means is we might see new males at some point, or we might see females that are attempting to escape from the chaos that a, an incoming unknown group of males will cause. And that's because when a male lion enters a new territory, his instinct is straight away to kill the cubs of the lionesses that he finds in order to bring them back into Eastra so that they will mate with him and allow him to pass on his genetic line. So yes, we do get to see new lions, we get to see new lion characters. And there are such things as nomadic lions as well, nomadic males that move about without a set territory. But all in all, nothing is ever set or definite, but the reason that we talk about our lion characters in the way that we do is because they're the ones that we see most often. But that is really in itself the best part of this job, because seeing new animals is wonderful, it's really exciting, and we do get really excited when we see them. But at the, on the other side of that coin is the fact that if you spend time with the individual groups, you get to know them, you get to know their history, you get a consistent view and a better understanding of the way in which the, the animals' lives play out day to day, rather than getting just bits of their stories. You get to follow them from start, not necessarily from start to finish, but certainly more significant portions of it. And what that means as well is that if you go on safari, if you were to come out here and visit, you'd stay for maybe three days, maybe you'd stay for a week, and you'd get to see the animals and then you'd have to go back home. And unless we had these live safaris, we wouldn't be able to continue the saga of what has happened. For example, with Shadow and Sindile and Shadow's cub, we will know how that situation continues to play out because we will continue to follow it. That being said, it's not a zoo. So we have to take the sightings when they come. We have to work to try and find the animals. We have to try and figure out where they are. And how we do that is we get out and we go tracking, which is what Brent has been doing. So let's find out how his walk went. Those tracks are really fresh. So I've circled them and I'm gonna call the tracking team. Uh, I think it's gonna take a little bit more deciphering uh, probably a good 45 minutes to an hour walking around in there uh, but really fresh tracks and I'm, I'm hoping we'll let the tracking team know and they're gonna come after drive and see if they can possibly find that male leopard I was hoping it was quarantine and he was going to do his follow me back to the car but you know we can't have all the luck all the time I'm gonna now start making our way back towards Juma but how wonderful to see those cheetah boys there are still lots of vehicles trying to get in there we don't see cheetah that often as a lot of our regular viewers will know and it is quite special uh, when we get to see those two boys I think the longest cheetah sighting in the safari live history was with genre and we literally spent three hours following them, those two boys through Juma and they don't come to Juma very often. I always like to check these big termite mounds. You never know what could be there. Well, wonderful to have another new viewer. Welcome Leah to the back of the safari vehicle. Leah says everything looks so green. How cold do our winters get? Well, uh, yeah, we go. I think it's a bit more yellow than green at the moment. We do have a few evergreen trees, 
and at the moment a lot of our trees are turning quite yellow and we are at the beginning of winter and uh, we don't get too cold the coldest I've ever experienced in about 10 years in this part of the world was about 30 degrees Fahrenheit which I think 32 degrees Fahrenheit which is zero uh, Celsius and I've only ever seen frost here once but on average, I'd probably say most mornings we're 50 odd, mid 50s Fahrenheit, so um, teens from the low teens. Oh, there we go, biting flies. Uh, from the low teens uh, up to the high teens is what our normal cold, cold mornings are. Uh, maybe next month we could get down to about seven or eight degrees. Very seldom uh, it goes colder than that. But as you can see, we don't really have uh, the traditional four seasons like uh, other places do. We've basically got two seasons. We've got cold and dry and hot and wet. Although this year it's been a drought, so there's been very little of the wet part. And you can see there's almost no grass around us. And uh, it's only the, really the trees that are, 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 are holding a bit of color. I'm hoping we're going to find some eddies. I feel like a big elephant bull today. You know, so that's, that's what we feel like. And hopefully we're going to be able to find one soon. As it starts getting warmer, those elephants are going to start moving towards the water holes. It's always a good place to check around. <laughs> well, I, again, awesome to have new viewers, and this is definitely one of the more interesting handles uh, of a viewer we've had. So a huge welcome to Funky Toe Odor. Uh, great to have you on the back of the vehicle. Uh, fortunately, Jean-Dre's toe odor is not too bad because he is sitting behind me. The wind keeps it going away. There we go. And he's got very large toes. <laughs> and, uh, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Funky Toe Odor would like to know uh, whether African elephants often kill other animals like buffalo. No, it's, it's actually unusual. It does happen from time to time, but it's definitely not the norm. That type of behavior quite often happens in a year like this year when we're in, in the grips of a drought. So there's huge competition for water. And I've seen elephant bulls literally stand in the middle of a water hole, not letting any other animal drink. And when they do, attack other animals. It's normally in those situations out there like we never know what can happen. There might be an elephant in a foul mood and it decides that that particular buffalo is very irritating so off they go. We head off the cheetah plans. It's not the elephants I was hoping for. There's a nice, oh I think, how's that John Ray? Here we go. The fluffiest of the fluffy antelope, uh, the waterbuck. I do love waterbuck. They are so, so pretty. Also, add a bit of... Com 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 oh, can't speak today. A bit of comic relief with that white bottom, that ring around the bottom. That's often said to say they look like they've just sat on a freshly painted toilet seat. Oh, wonderful. Another name I, I don't know. So wonderful to have all the new viewers today. Uh, Faze Cutter and would like to know, is a waterbuck like a deer? It is not. It is an antelope. Now, the females don't have horns. The males do, but unlike deer, <coughs> uh, their horns are permanent. They don't fall off. And oh, look at that tail's working overtime at the moment to keep the flies off. Now, phase cutter, uh, we don't have any deer naturally occurring in South Africa. The only actual naturally occurring deer are in Morocco, right on the north of Africa. And uh, they are a remnant population uh, from when there was a land bridge between Arabia, Europe and, and Africa. 
and a lot of migrations happened there. The last land bridge, um, when the seas were much, much lower, of course, was about 30,000 years ago. <clears throat> And uh, there's a population of red deer in Morocco. There's also a remnant population of grey wolves in Morocco. And also that whole North African area, you get sheep species that have migrated in. And you do not have any sheep species naturally occurring uh, down this far south. Uh, very, very interesting how uh, the world has changed so often over the last well, the last 4.2 billion years. <laughs> the only only, well, one of my favorite little sayings is the only, only, oh, now I can't even remember it. The only firm, the only thing you guaranteed with looking at the Earth's history is that it will change. And the only, constant. only, thank you, the only constant is change. Jean-Dre, putting the words in my mouth. Thank you very much. I needed that. So we are about to go through a little area where we do sometimes get a bit of signal breakup. So we'll have a quick look through here. Now, just making sure there are no tracks. Uh, so we do not disturb your safari experience before we get to that bad area. Back to Jamie and see what she's up to. while Brent goes through the bad signal area, I just had an interesting update because apparently the alarm calls that we heard earlier repeated themselves and it wasn't just that the monkeys were calling outside the lodge, it seems as though the guys there actually saw a leopard, which is very interesting. Now we've gone straight back towards the Galago Pan area to see if we can't figure out where he might be. I say he, like I know it's a he, I don't. I have no idea which leopards it might be, but I suspect it, it makes the most sense that it is a bulla. And we're gonna try and get there before the end of the sun, sunrise safari and hopefully we will be able to spot him. It would be terribly exciting if you were about. This yesterday was the first time that I've seen him Vula in a good few months. I've missed out on a couple of sightings with him. So it was the first time I've seen him in a long time. And it was fantastic to see him looking healthy, hungry, but not unhealthy, no hungrier than any leopard might look after a few days without food. It's all hyena tracks. Just checking very carefully. <laughs> the return of our hyena clan is fantastic, but it does mean that we have to concentrate a little bit harder on our distinguishing between individual paw prints. Okay, let's speed up a bit through here. So the kill site, apart from my inability to keep my hat on, stay. Stay. Uh, the kill site is probably about a, sort of 200 feet in here. No, he could have been, this is an enormous patch of land without any roads through it, so he could have been moving through there the whole of last night. He might even have a kill, and that he was just on his way to go and have a quick drink, and then head back to it. It's such a massive block. And as you saw earlier, an incredibly dense one, packed full of monkey orange trees. Also the wind that is attempting to take my, sweep my hat off my head. But at least it is nice and warm this morning. Uh, Tony in Holland, good morning on the subject of our hyena clan. You're wondering, let's say that we came upon that sighting that we did yesterday morning, but we were on foot. Let's take the, the lions out of the equation for now. You're wondering if we came upon hyenas with their tails up and in an excited feeding frenzy maybe, or an excited state, would we be safe or would you be in any kind of danger? And the answer is you'd be absolutely safe. Hyena are, we're not on their menu at all. In fact, even if you came upon that at night, you would be absolutely fine. If you ran at a hyena at night, 
it would run away from you. Lions are a very different story. Lions are afraid of people during the day, but at night, they turn into a different animal and we turn into a different animal. We're a lot more vulnerable. We are not adapted evolutionary-wise to be the dominant species at night. The lions are. That is their, that's their, their role. Absolutely, you would find with hyenas, and it's out a few times at night. The only time a hyena poses a risk to human life, or even health, or even he is sleeping outside unprotected. A tent is fine. Even a mosquito net might be okay. But sleeping out in the open without any protection, or even leaving your door open when you go to bed at night is a very silly idea. It's because hyenas are curious, They're, they scavenge as well as predate, which means that they go and investigate, and they investigate, since they don't have hands or thumbs, they investigate with their teeth. And you really, really don't want a hyena investigating your sleeping body with its teeth, because you're going to find yourself with a serious injury. So that is the only time that a hyena really poses a risk to human beings. There's a little bit of danger in the fact that and it particularly occurs around some of the Kruger camps, although that's, things have changed, things are a great deal better. But people, for some unknown reason, and I don't, I don't fully buy the ignorance story, they feel like it's a really nice idea to feed the animals around the campsites. And that, to me, irritates me because there's signs everywhere, so they can't claim ignorance. It's arrogance. They want to see the animal come up nice and close, and ultimately they will result in the death of that animal because they wanted to see it up close and personal. And that's when hyena do become dangerous, same as, same as baboons. Baboons also become dangerous, particularly the big males, when they are fed by people, they associate people with food, and that they're still a wild animal, but they're used to and they feel as though people are not dangerous or not a threat. I just want to investigate something. I saw them earlier, but I didn't think anything of it because they're up in the dead tree, which is to be expected with vultures. There you are. They're probably forward a little bit might help. There you go. The vultures from yesterday are all sitting in this dead tree. But that being said, it's a little bit further away from where the kill site is, or where the kill site was, and they're still here. It is chilly, but it is warming up very quickly. And it becomes an interesting question, well, there's an interesting question in my mind about whether they just spent the night here, or if they're actually waiting for their chance to descend and snack on something. I think, however, it's likely that they just spent the night here. Generally, vultures, when they roost, will roost in dead trees, which makes utmost sense when you think about the fact that they're actually quite clumsy flyers. They're heavy, they're bulky, and they can't really bob and weave, which means that roosting in a tree with leaves means that they run the risk of catching themselves on those leaves. And it's only really when there's a kill on the ground and they're waiting for their opportunity to feed on it, that they will actually sit in trees with leaves. I think though, judging, I'm just trying to work out from the temperatures, I think they're just waiting for it to heat up so that the hot air currents start to come through and they are able to thermal. They don't seem to be looking intently in one direction. They're just kind of waiting before it's time to go off in search of other things. No, they're doing a good, good preen, good groom. Looks like mostly white-backed vultures, although of course we're staring straight into the sun. But we've only got their silhouettes, but judging by the size and the shapes of their heads, they look like a group of white-backed vultures. Always a striking silhouette, that. The dead tree with a vulture on it or a couple of them. And they probably, despite... Oh, is that Roller bombing them? It was. <laughs> Rollers are oh, fantastic birds. Well done, Brian. That was incredible. I didn't even pick up on that fact initially. Rollers are funny birds. They're quite aggressive. I mean, there's absolutely no reason 
to go and dive bomb a group of vultures, and the vultures clearly couldn't have cared less, but it's just that instinct to go for a bird of prey silhouette or bird of prey shape, go and scare them away, because the rollers are, like the drongos, quite brave little birds. They'll go and they'll attack birds much, much larger than they are in an attempt to keep them safe and secure. Now, uh, Melissa, while we go off in search of our leopard that was apparently hiding around here somewhere, being sneaky as leopards are, you want to know if it is difficult to tell the difference between the paw prints of the individual leopards or if there is a big difference to them. The answer is yes, it is difficult to tell the difference between the individuals and no, there isn't a big difference between them. Males and females, it's usually relatively easy, even with a, a young male of Sindile's size. Even when Sindile, the young male, was a year old, his feet were still larger than his mum's. So there's a huge size difference between a male track and a female track. I've been, over the last few months, trying out a project of measuring the different tracks and trying to build up an idea of the differences in size. But to be honest, I don't know exactly how accurate it is. It's given us some interesting info about track length and rela the relationship between the back track and the front track and so on. But it doesn't really s help us because you need to get build up a database in all the different soil types before you can start to, and I'd have to think up some kind of formula. It's a difficult one. It is a very difficult one. But there will be certain proportions that the back feet ha will have to the front feet. I know people who, s who know the, particularly the master trackers, they obviously see some kind of minute difference in the tracks of the cats that allow them to come to the conclusion that it's one individual over another. Karula's tracks compared to, say, Tsukani, the young female that's been moving about here, are small. She's a tiny leopard. She comes from a tiny family line. They're very short and they're quite, they're not stocky. And Sakani's so much taller and her feet are just that fraction larger. That you can, those sorts of differences you can observe. But can I tell the difference between Karula and her daughter Shadow by their tracks? Not, no. Absolutely not. I have to be completely honest with you, I think Shadows are slightly smaller from what I've observed. But I don't think that I could tell the difference completely. I'm just stopping here. I wanted to just double check the ground for leopard tracks. It's tricky in this thick sand, but this is the sort of area that the leopards love to move through. They love these river systems that cut through towards the lodge. It provides so much cover. But he has, or has he? No, those are hyena tracks way in the distance. We're going to keep searching, see if we can't figure out exactly where it is he's gone. While we do that, let's go back to Brent for an update from wherever he is. I'm not even sure he's on Cheetah Plains anymore. And we're on the Cheetah Cut Line. I'm just really hoping that those female leopard tracks maybe meander to the, to the uh, west and also it's about that time when that Nkuma lioness is going to start moving her den more frequently. So it's always worth having a quick check along our eastern front to see if there's been any invasions. Now, of course, a, a very happy Father's Day to everyone. And I hope you're all spoiling your dad's rotten. Maybe dad's even allowed beer for breakfast today. Wonderful to hear from Shabo again today, who's a new viewer. Shabo would like me to find a peacock. Uh, Shabo, there's only one peacock species that occurs in Africa, and it's possibly one of the most difficult birds in the world to find. It lives right between the Cross and Congo River in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, about 1,500 kilometers from here. So unfortunately, we don't have any peacocks out in the savanna. Uh, the peacocks you see more regularly are indigenous to India. So, and of 
unfortunately, until we do live safaris in India, I think it's going to be a bit hard for us to find a peacock. But it has reminded me about a really fascinating fact about peacocks and the only African peacock species. I do not have my big bird book of Africa here. I've only got my Southern Africa book. So I'm going to ask Jamie a little later to show you what a Congo peacock looks like. They also have a very strange call. But the Congo peacock was only discovered in the 1960s. So it, it's one of the latest finds from that sort of birding world to be discovered. And, uh, and strange enough, it's quite a big bird and it's quite a vocal bird as well. There are just so few people that are able to get into that part of Congo. It's probably one of the mo most remote places in the world. Now, there's another interesting creature that lives in that area, and it's the bonobo, or pygmy chimpanzee. And genetically, they are the closest to human beings. Also, it's a good place for a carpy. So it is a, a, re a real place of weird and wonderful creatures. And one of the least explored zones left in Africa and I definitely wouldn't mind a, a trundle or two around there sometime in my life. Okay, so no sign of those tracks yet. Might be moving into Torchwood. She can always come back. And the one thing, especially in winter, is the leopards are quite mobile during the daylight hours. Nice to have another question from Sham Sun. And Sham Sun is wondering about concessions. She say, I always talk about concessions in the bush. So you have a diff a various different types of land. So at the moment, you know, Juma, Cheetah Plains, and Arethusa is what we would consider our, our concession. That is the, the area we have rights to drive on. Uh, and uh, it's slightly different from uh, so a concession in Botswana. A concession in Botswana is a, an area outside of the national parks normally uh, that is leased to safari companies by the government. And, uh, and then they are allowed to build a, a lodge, but it has to be able to be taken down with almost zero, zero sign of that lodge ever having existed. So that, that is a concession. And, and then even in, in certain national parks like Kruger, there are sections that are off the sort of public roads uh, where, again, private companies can lease uh, the, that area from, uh, from the government. And then it creates good income for the national parks and for the governments, and it, and it makes sure there's more areas under wildlife. Now we've got a, another bird for everyone. And sitting quite prominently there, it's White Crown Shrike basking in the morning sun. Now, while he's perched on top of that dead tree, he's keeping his eye out for any little bit of movement. Now, sharks are incredible little predators and you can actually see a slight hook on his beak. And they sometimes display quite macabre behavior and they keep pantries. So whatever grasshopper or insect they catch, if they're full, they'll impale it on a thorn tree so they can come back, oh, off he goes, to get it at a later stage. Now, the one problem with keeping a pantry out here is that if someone watch, is watching you, and one of the, the naughtiest birds in this circumstance is the fork-tailed dronga, they'll watch a strike load up its pantry, and then as it disappears, the dronga just jumps in for a free meal. Well, we've been chatting a bit about our bird lists, and uh, Justin says his bird list is currently at 170, but he might have forgotten to write down 
A lion track there. One or two. Unfortunate. It is, and the lion is left leaving us. There we go. A single lioness. Now this is heading towards where that Nkuma female's got a den. You got them there, Jandre. Oops, sorry. My bad driving has made you see Peter's leg. There we go. Beautiful fresh track, but unfortunately it is leaving our traverse area. Oh look, there's an ant inside. The lion track. Oh, isn't that beautiful? It's got something in its jaws. What has it got there? I'm just gonna. Right, that ant is so tiny. I'm just gonna jump out of the car. Sorry, it's gonna. Zandre's on super moon, zoom, so it might bounce. I just wanna see what it's got in its mouth. Oh, did you see where it went, Zandre? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Now, you saw that ant. Now, you're going to see how big it is. Look at the size of my finger. Isn't that incredible? Now, it is so small. I'm trying to see what it's got in its mouth. And I can barely see it this range. What has it got? Let's take your finger for comparison. It looks like it's got another tiny ant species, but even half the size of that. Isn't that incredible? You stop for a lion track and you find the smallest thing <laughs> in the world. And we normally leave that up to Steph and Jandre and Bushwalk. It must be because Jandre is on the vehicle today and he's, he's bringing his Bushwalk eyes out to spot the little things. Now, I know Taxon's looking for lions and he isn't tortured, so I'm just going to give him a quick call on the radio, let him know about those tracks. And while we continue to check our eastern front, let's go see what Jamie's been up to. Well, we actually did a little bit of a, oh, hello, a check of the eastern area as well. But I still think that that leopard that we were tracking earlier, if she is Karula. I'm just listening to the updates on the Game Drive channel. Hello. Oh, we spot the odd one out over here. <laughs> a group of Duggar boys and one somewhat misplaced either female or young male. I'm inclined to go with young male, just judging by the curves of the horns. The young males do get the tufts of hair around the base of the skull, just the our base of the horns, just in the same way that the females do. But those horns are quite large and beautifully curved up and around. The reason I say misplaced is because a young buffalo like this should not be with a group of old buffalo bulls. Now it's not, in, it's not uncommon to see this but it's almost always as a result of the buffalo being terrorized by something at some point in the night and the young buffalo becoming separated from the rest of the herd or a female buffalo becoming separated from the rest of the herd and because that herding instinct within buffalo is so strong they automatically join up with a group of dugger boys or mud boys like these old males are here. They always look so, what's the word? I suppose disinterested, disconnected <laughs> from us, just enjoying their time in the sun, but always completely uniquely marked. A buffalo bull of this age bears the scars of his life complete with scars around his face, as you can see with this one, along with the bald patches from fungal infections or a touch of mange here and there, and the big deep grooves in their horns, all tell the story of a relatively tough life that they have lived. And we appear to have one curious fellow who's decided to come and have a little bit of a closer look at us. 
On buffalo bulls, their eyesight is not fantastic. They rely far more on their sense of smell and their sense of hearing. And they'll often come and investigate a little bit closer if you give them the opportunity to. One kind of skin disease. It could be from rubbing. They do have glands around the eye. And where they often do rub the eyes around that area. I do just want to get onto the Game Drive channel. Sorry, guys. Brent is talking about the line tracks that we've been following earlier. But as soon as he lets me get a word in edgeways, I'll be able to. <laughs> just have a look at your buffalo. Brent, those Nkunzo cross south at Buffles Hook East Road. Um, I couldn't find exactly where they went off the road. They had been driven over earlier. Copy, there's also Nkunzo for Mufazi Ingwe, not far from those Milona Nkunzo, also cutting south um, just to the east of the Buffles Hook East Junction. And now we have, oh, you, get, you know what, it is a female, but she is, she's got impressive horns for a female buffalo. There you go, you can see much smaller than the stocky build of the buffalo bulls. Also a much lighter color, much lighter brown than the almost black of the skin of the buffalo bulls. She's also got a slight limp as she moves through the area. And I think that there's a good chance that she's been separated. There's, it's almost a definite that she got separated from that enormous herd of buffalo, close to about a thousand, that moved through this area about a day and a half ago. Never fear. She will be reunited at some point with the rest of her herd. It might not be the herd that she left, but buffalo are quite happy, they're very gregarious animals, they're quite happy to join up with any other herd that they might find. But for now, she's found herself some company in the form of these Duggar boys. Right, buffs, I suppose you've seen a leopard walk past here, have you? I'm trying to, I don't know Mvula as well as I know Tingana. I'm trying to check out the sort of the regularly used leopard paths, pathways that might give us a better hint as to exactly where he might have gone. I couldn't find a single track around Gallego Pan. And whatever the lip, wherever the leopard came from, he managed to levitate to that area to where he was seen and then levitate away again. There's also so much hyena activity that it's exceptionally difficult to it's kind of like playing a game of where's Wally when hyenas walked all over the, the all over the road up and down and you've got to try and spot the leopard toe in amongst all of those tracks but we're going to keep trying we haven't yet given up hope it's not the end of the sunrise safari just yet okay let's carry on a little bit See if we can't figure out where he went we just keep circling the area in sort of ever-increasing circles to see if we don't pick up on tracks coming out. to Siberia Zumi as always just on the subject of our various leopard males we've been speaking about Mbula who is a dispersal ma male because he's old he's reaching the end of his well he's reached the end of the time as his dominant male and he is now basically on the run for many threats but there's also another reason why a leopard male will disperse and that's because they're young and Siberia Zumi would like to know whether we have any updates on Kunuma which is the, he is the son of Karula from her previous litter, two litters before this, a young male who is 
now coming up to the point where he's going to be looking for a territory. Not quite. He's probably got another year or so before he is ready, big enough and large enough to start competing. Although the interesting thing about Panuma, I don't know him all that well. I've only ever seen him once. But I've heard tell that he packs quite an attitude. And I also heard a rumor that he beat up one of the large dominant males in Londolozi um, and showed him who was boss. I, I don't think necessarily that he was taking over the territory. But from what I've heard, he does come with a huge amount of personality. And it does go to show that it's not just about size. There's an aspect of how aggressive the animal is, how prepared they are to fight, how bold they are. And Kanuma was famous for lying down, sleeping, and then all of a sudden he'd get up and he'd go running at the car going Burr! and then lie down again in the shade. Brian, you had that a few times. Many times. Many times. I never got to, I didn't really get to spend much time with Kanuma. I arrived just as he dispersed. But Siberia Zumi, I'll double check on that update and see exactly where it was. It was from about 10 days ago or so. But last time we heard, yes, he was way south, in Londolozi and Mala Mala and those areas. So quite far from where we are. Well, I've been wondering where all of our elephants are. It's been very quiet on the elephant front for us. But it seems as though they were just waiting for me to leave Buffles Hook Dam before they arrived for a drink. Let's head over to Brent there now. Look at them having so much fun in the mud. Oh, look at that. Go to the right, lying down, getting a real coating of mud. Oh, it's okay, girls. This female in, fr in front of us is a little bit unsure of us. Um, and that one coming up the back. Hey, it's okay, it's okay. Stop your nonsense. Stop your nonsense. I uh, see there's very, very obvious, uncomfortable display. You can see she doesn't want to take her eyes off us. Uh, her body language is stiff. And she's looking a bit better now that she's created a bit of distance with us. <laughs> what is that young male doing? Look at him. He's obviously seen a picture of a circus elephant. He's trying to copy him. I've never seen an elephant hold that pose for that long. Maybe he's got a headache and he's trying to push his forehead. Oh, last night, Saturday night, it was a rough one. <laughs> he's still doing it. Actually, I'm going to get a photo now. Well, as I probably... Ah, uh, isn't that amazing? Oh, and how's that for timing? It looks like there's another herd of Eddie's about to arrive on the other side. I'm just going to move. Oh, look at the water walk coming through there. Just going to get us in a bit, a slightly better spot. Just trying to see that herd's going to come down and the, the elephants are looking a little bit unrelaxed so don't want to get down too close just yet till, till we can really gauge their behavior and you see those ones are leaving and then coming across there's another herd I almost seem to be waiting for the others to leave before coming down. And there's the rest of the herd disappearing. Just move again. Not this, this particular herd here to the, to the left of us is not very relaxed. So we're not going to go any closer. I'm just going to stay here, uh, give them enough space that they feel comfortable. Can you hear all the noises? So 
such incredible noises that elephants can make. But while we wait for the next herd to come down for a drink, uh, let's go across to Jamie, who's got some elephants of her own. The lovely news is that I said earlier that I wanted to see some elephants this morning and that they were avoiding me. Here we go. Well, the big cow is going to come right up to us. So we'll keep our movements nice and slow. She's going to come say hello. Hello, big girl. All right, big girl, yeah, we know. I know you're big. I know you're big. Hello, big girl. Nice and slow on the back there. Hello, big girl. All right. How's it, girl? Hey, it's okay. We're not going to do anything. We're just chilling. Okay. Thank you, big girl. It's okay, it's all right, it's not me. That was your baby, not mine. Okay, guys, we've got this stunning scene, but as they move past us, we're going to send you back to Brent's elephants, who are coming down to drink. So we, that herd has now come down to the edge of the water, and... Looks like they're about to start. Oh, there's a tiny one to the left. Hello, little one. Oh. <laughs> lots of noises, lots going on. Isn't this just exquisite? I'm hoping they're going to move towards the mud as well and have a good splish splash. Now we watched some very interesting behavior as, as one herd moved off, the other waited till coming down to the water. And Shamsun's wondering, do they mingle nicely? Sometimes, generally if they're, they're related herds, but other times they, they don't really get on too much. There they can be quite a bit of screaming and trumpeting and pushing of each other. Oh, isn't this just wonderful? I hope you're getting some good screenshots there of all the Ellie's having a drink. hear them, just hear the water as they draw it up into their trunk. They can be so, so peaceful. Now these water holes are becoming so important as we head deeper into the drought. <laughs> Just heard a little one trumpet and he trumpeted at a little uh, blacksmith lapwing that was walking near him. Oh, go to the left, he's going to chase the, chasing the birds. She actually, there you go, that one there. Which is chasing the bird, is trumpeting at the little, little lapwing. <laughs> a little female and decided that it didn't like that little bird. a very interesting question from Lily Garden. Uh, Lily says, how do elephants 
drink and then have a dust bath immediately afterwards and not clog their trunks with mud. Well, I presume it's just because there's such a force that they can blow that out that it will, will clean it out. Now, the inside of their trunks is always going to be slightly moist. And there's always a mucus, mucus layer there. But you probably find that it's just the incredible pressure that they're able to exert through their trunk enables them not to have a big uh, mud buildup in their noses. So, so peaceful. That's a little boy. It's always funny when they sort of play with their trunks and they blow bubbles. Now they can hold about two gallons of water in their trunk. about just under nine liters. I'm hoping what they do is that they drink their full and then they move off to the mud wallow. Very thirsty eddies. And on average an adult elephant We'll drink oof, up to up to 100 liters of water a day, normally a little bit less. Those two decided to go to the other side. Good morning, Kathy in Tennessee. I hope you are loving this elephant sighting as much as I am. Now, Kathy's wondering, at what age do elephants stop having babies? Kathy, it's probably around the early 50s uh, that they will stop producing babies. So their last, their last baby will be probably early 50s, and then after that, no more babies. This is playing with the water. <laughs> Don't you know it's a drought, madam? You can't be wasting like that. Hopefully they're gonna to move towards the mud wallow. Starting to move around in that direction. You can see the other, the last herd had a good wallow and got that mud nice and messy over there. What have you spotted? Oh, the mud wallow. Yes. <laughs> I thought you, I saw the way I thought John had spotted something I'd missed. I was like, oh, what's there? And quite often the cameramen do spot things before us. Now, hi, Mohammed. Uh, Mohammed wants to know, can an elephant actually go under the water and keep its trunk up above like a snorkel? And uh, Mohammed, yes, they do. And they can do it quite well. They can actually even go underwater for a couple of minutes. And I've seen them crossing large rivers uh, in other parts of Africa. And I actually got a few photographs of just an elephant trunk coming out of the water. I was watching this female, just watching her body language. Now, because it's a drought, there is a bit of stress on the animals, but she looks fine. She's just giving her ear a scratch. Oh, yes. That's a very nice, relaxed uh, posture. It does have an itchy ear, though. Okay, I'm just going to move the vehicle. It looks like they're going to go to the mud wallow.
Let's try to get a slightly better angle for Jandre. With that light. Oh, it looks like they might ignore the mud wallow. This is not a wallowing family. How's that, Chandra? Oh, maybe it is a wallowing family. So what they're doing at the moment is they're smelling all the other elephants that were just here. So probably picking up some information, of course, with that trunk, and they could probably smell a lot better and pick up on a lot of different things that we wouldn't be able to. They definitely are far more relaxed as a herd around the vehicles than the last herd. Now, occasionally when we're watching elephants in the mud wallow, we get a bit of mud on ourselves. Hello, little one. That little one looks very excited to go play in the mud. Very long single tusk on that female who's getting the mud the correct consistency. Now, the mud acts on a couple of different reasons. It cools them down. It also helps with ticks. So the ticks get encased in that mud and they're able to rub them off on a, on a tree or a, or a fallen log. So I use their feet. Oh, hey! Get that mud going. There we go. Spa day. Oh, that was magic. There's only three of them really getting involved in the mud. Little one getting right into the thick of it. I won't lie, I, I, I'm a bit jealous. I think that would be a great time. John Andre, would you like to go for a mud bath like that? Yep. Yeah, he's got a good coating of mud now. <laughs> uh, little one's trying to have a drink while mom's having a mud bath. That's not going to work. Yes, mom's telling you no. But mom. Thank you for joining us on this incredible sunrise safari, cheetah elephants. And don't forget, 9 a.m. EDT, Nat Geo Wild will be doing another live TV broadcast uh, for the Sunset Safari. And we hope you will all join us. It's been fantastic having you here. And uh, from Jamie and myself, uh, we can't wait to see you in a, free sh a, a few short hours. And remember, 9 a.m. E-D-T, Nat Geo Wild. Come have a look at your favorite animal characters. But till then, bye.